If the attacks of September 11, 2001 were a second Pearl Harbor, where are we in the war that began that day? Are we winning, losing, or stalemated? Last year worldwide, there were more than 10,000 terrorist attacks. That's about five times the number in 2001. So what have we learned, or more important, what do we still need to learn? Are there policies and strategies that ought to be put in place? I'm joined on Foreign Policy by Stephen Hadley, former National Security Advisor to President George W. Bush, and now the chair of the U.S. Institute for Peace, a congressionally founded and funded policy institute, Nancy Lindborg, president of the USIP, and Ruel Mark Gorecht, a senior fellow at FDD and a former Middle East specialist in the CIA's Directorate of Operations. This is Foreign Policy. Either the U.S. enforces some rules in the world, or there are no Every U.S. Rules. president has tried to diminish tension with Russia, has reached out to the Russians. Most of those have failed, especially when Vladimir Putin became the leader. They're still killing guys who joined the jihad in 1979 or 1980 or 1981 who are still in the We game. are seeing a ramp up in North Korean cyber capabilities over the last decade. Iran is basically putting forth these claims of nuclear innocence that they are doing nothing wrong, that there are no violations, and that's just factually not correct. I am fearful for what happens to Turkey now. If you thought that it was dangerous that a coup might have toppled this democracy, think about what this very autocratic man might do. The attacks of 17 years ago came out of a clear blue sky, literally, but not figuratively. For one, we should have been able to envision the possibility of jets being used as guided missiles. Trucks, cars, boats, all have been used to target, uh, by, uh, as, as vessels for targeting terrorists. And we knew there were these various extremist groups who wanted to do us damage. So why were we so unprepared? Was it a, a failure of imagination? Well, it's one thing to envision a particular form of a ca- attack. It's another to know who, what, where, when, and how in specifics. You know, there are a lot of airlines, flights into this country every day. So it's a problem, I think, of we not want a vision, but a failure to have the intelligence that allowed us to be able to say, on this day, these flights are coming our way and therefore have the kind of actionable information you would need to interrupt it and prevent it. Well, you were in the CIA. You were studying these groups. Do you think the CIA didn't imagine sufficiently the possibility of a catastrophic attack such as the one that Osama bin Laden launched? Oh, I think by the time of 9-11, they were aware of the possibility. I think uh, that the agency didn't take Islamic militancy quite as seriously as it should have early on. Uh, but it's an extremely difficult game. And the real truth, uh, penetrate an organization like that is extraordinarily difficult. I can say I don't think the agency made a really serious effort to do so, primarily because to do so, you probably would have lost lives. You would have failed uh, probably several times before you succeeded. So Congress ha- asked the U.S. Institute uh, for peace to develop, and I'll, I'll quote it, a comprehensive plan to prevent the underlying causes of extremism in fragile states in the Sahel, Horn of Africa, and the Near East. So, Nancy, what are the underlying causes of extremism in that region or any region? Well, actually, we have, uh, through the task force, been looking at exactly that question. Yes. Um, over the past 17 years, there's been quite a bit of accumulated scholarship, lessons, experiences um, that help us uh, try to gather all that together and understand what, what are the key learnings. Um, what we have concluded in the initial report that is coming out is uh, there are while every situation is different, there are some key themes that uh, extremists are able to recruit more effectively when you have large populations who feel a sense of injustice, who feel excluded uh, from the ability to participate in their social, political, and economic life, um, and where you have the organizations and the structures that enable that kind of recruitment to go forward. The report, the the interim report coming out this week, 
doesn't look at this, but you, you also have extremists coming out of France, Germany, Britain. These are countries that do have political inclusion, that do have tolerance, that are economically prosperous, that are free. Does it not tell us something that even when a country is free and prosperous, extremism of the kind we're talking about, and we'll get into what we're talking about, nonetheless emerges and those extremists emerge, doesn't that? In other words, if you were able to make Libya into Tunisia, you'd still be getting terrorists out of Tunisia. If you're able to make Tunisia into Belgium, you'd still be getting terrorists coming out of that. Does that not worry you? I'll go to you on it, Steve, but you both can chime in. Does that worry you that you're going to put all this effort into trying to make these societies better, and yet that may not cure the problem, maybe because, you again, we have terrorists emerging in the U.S. as well. Right, but the terrorists that emerge in the United States or France – we have the institutions and the capabilities to deal with that problem and present, prevent it from being a threat to our people. But in fragile states, uh, you don't have that situation. You have governments that are many times corrupt, that uh, don't have legitimacy, that are not providing services for their people. You have people then increasingly disaffected from their governments, looking for an alternative, and then the extremists step in with an alternative vision, a state that is authoritarian, that is exclusive, um, that uh, is uh, really brutal in, in, in its um, application, but is nonetheless an alternative vision. And then in some of these states, you have outside parties, regional states, uh, global players who are coming in and meddling as well. And in those situations, these terrorists cannot be managed. And indeed, what we've seen is a is a shift in strategy from the extremists from using these fragile states as a base of operations to attack the United States and Europe to actually saying, hey, we can take over these states. We can make them a model of the Islamist vision of a state. And that, of course, has all kinds of consequences in terms of destabilizing those states, destabilizing the neighborhoods, refugee flows that really actually destabilized Europe. Uh, and is a major disruptor. So it's it's not that you won't get uh, some individual terrorists out of even uh, good governance states. It is the, that those terrorists in fragile states can do real harm. If you look at it historically, it's pretty clear that Islamic militancy rises because of the westernization of the Middle East. Uh, it starts with the Muslim elites who embrace westernization with a great deal of enthusiasm and it gains speed as ever larger swaths of the population also find westernization attractive. Uh, and it also ties into a profound historical narrative and that is – I mean, Islam really is more than any of the, of the other great faiths. It's a religion of rebellion and revolt. It defines early Islamic history as uh, Muslims inevitably start to look back at the early period to just define their identity, to define their ideals. You lock on quite powerfully to this narrative of rebellion uh, and to the narrative of, of, you know, of salvation and redemption and justice. Uh, and I think that's, that, that, that is quite seductive. It's seductive for uh, people who live in illegitimate, under illegitimate regimes. And let's be honest, uh, most of the regimes in the Middle East or Muslim Middle East are illegitimate. Uh, and it's very powerful, I think, also for Muslims who live in, in Europe. Uh, you can seduce a number of people, particularly in the atomized West, with a notion of collective action, of salvation and redemption. So I, the historical component of this is really quite profound. I think it gets underplayed often and we tend to look at this because it's a little ugly at times. We tend to look at the sociological components, which I think are good too. Uh, and we want to individualize the, the cases of Islamic extremism. But I think you need to always have in your back of mind the, this narrative. And I would say that you always should look at your enemy for answers. And uh, if you look at, for example, bin Laden or Azawahiri's commentary uh, on democracy amongst Muslims, they feared it because they knew very well that they could not develop their own narrative that essentially said the majority of Muslims were illegitimate. Uh, so I would go in that direction, I think, without political reform. Uh, without greater investment by the people in the region, you aren't going to solve this problem. 
I just want to I want to emphasize one thing that that Ruel has where Ruel has brought us is we are now talking about a specific form of extremism. You would you can call it Islamic extremism. It let me let you talk about that. But I want to the report is a little coy on this subject. It never names it as such. It says there are forms of extremism that look towards the creation of an Islamic state, uh, and these are particularly dangerous to us. But you avoid. You avoid the word Islam as much as possible. You never use the word jihad, jihad, uh, and you never talk about jihadism as an ideology. So maybe reflect on those points. Let me make two points. One, uh, we do not use jihad because for many um, Muslims, it has a positive connotation, and we can talk about that. But we do say, we talk about extremism in the report, and then we say that in the Middle East, the particular extremism we see there is an Islamist extremism that seeks exclusionary and authoritarian governments based on a harsh vision of Sharia law. We say that explicitly. It's very interesting what Rule says. If you go back to after 9-11 and if you had asked us where were we going to see a problem of violent extremism, we would have said it was in Asia, not in the Middle East. And Indonesia in particular, what happened? The Indonesians... One, played the nationalism card and began to describe a future that is democratic in Indonesia, an offer to their people to build a more positive society that is an alternative vision to that offered by the extremists. Uh, And secondly, they have a more moderate version of Islam and they propagated. They were prepared to answer the ideology of the extremists who perverted Sharia and perverted Islam for their own political purposes. Um, I think what you've seen in the Middle East is uh, the countries there becoming late to the realization that, in fact, some of the proselytization uh, they had done there fed into the extremist narrative. And one of the things that you've seen in recent years, in, including coming out of the summit that President Trump held in Riyadh, was a commitment to combat in the Middle East the extremist narrative and version of Islam with a much more moderate mainstream for, form of Islam. They have been late coming to that, and it is a fight over the future direction of Islam that only Muslims can participate in. But it is a positive development, though it's late in coming. Let me just challenge you a little bit on the concept of perverted <clears throat> version of Islam. Um, it is not, I, there's no question that most Muslims do not embrace the Ben Ladenist version or the Khomeinist version of Islam. I totally agree with that. But that doesn't mean it's false theologically necessarily. I mean, there is in Islamic history and in scripture some basis for an ideology that is, that emphasizes jihad as a war against the West. You can find it in Scripture, and you can certainly, if you read a, any history of the, of, the, of the medieval caliphs, many of them uh, were engaged most of all in jihad against the Byzantine Empire, against infidels, against others. That, that was the basis for their, their reputation and their glory. There is, this does exist. Now, Bernard, Bernard Lewis, who you and I knew, and maybe you did, Ruel and others may have as well, said, look, we're fighting a movement within the Islamic world. It's not the only movement, but it is a movement. And Richard John Newhouse said, look, jihadism, if we, if we, this is a neologism, we're making up a word. It's an ideology, an ideology that stresses the imperative that one way or another the world must be made Islamic, preferably through the sword, because again, they're looking back to the seventh century, the eighth century, the ninth century and saying, we have to do it the way they did it. No other way we can't do it at the ballot box. We can't do it. This is how we have to accomplish our aims. Go ahead, Nancy. Well, I would just note that as you said, Cliff, there are, there are many versions of Islam. Exactly. And, you know, having recently been in Nigeria, I can tell you that, you know, they, they for, uh, many hundreds of years followed a more moderate Sufi version of mm-hmm. Islam. But starting about 30 years ago, the Iranians started investing in proselytizing uh, an extreme version of Shia, Shiite uh, Islam, and the Saudis brought in the Wahhabi Salafists. Right. And so you have now, because of that, the makings of 
a, a, a kind of Islamist um, extremism that turned into Boko Haram and now is starting to mutate into strains of ISIS and Al Qaeda. That's that's I that is without question the the dynamic that has gone forward. I would say the majority of their recruits can barely read. They have no knowledge of what are the real tenets of Islam, and they certainly don't know the history that you've laid out. So I think it's also useful to separate out the the recruiters who are hooking on to various parts of, of Islam for purposes, whether it's trying to go back to history or whatever, from the those who are recruited, mm-hmm. who may have a variety of reasons for why they are attracted to what's being given to them. Or- Simply put, modernity is a bitch. <laughs> uh, and it, it tends to wipe out our sense of the past. It wipes out uh, the and sometimes disowns the world of our fathers and our grandfathers. Uh, in uh, the Islamic world, that's not a good thing. Um, so, and when you combine the this sort of very modernizing Islamic militancy uh, with uh, 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 with the historical narrative, the final product uh, can be quite vicious. Uh, however, I mean, I have to say the uh, the one thing that is true about the Middle East and it's been true for centuries, and that is it is highly adaptive, it is highly absorptive. So things are changing there, and I would always emphasize that the probably the most secular country in the entire region is now Iran. That uh, th- that a theocracy actually sec- secularizes. It demotes God, you might say. It certainly demotes the men who who carry God upon their shoulders. So uh, I think uh, you know there is considerable hope there, and it's uh, it's a f- very fluid situation. I would commend with the report. I think the, re- the I think it's 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 high time the United States steps back from counterterrorism. Counterterrorism has its place. Uh, but it, I think it as, is at best a bandage and it, at worst it's deception. Uh, so you, we should have a fuller discussion about the roots uh, because that will take us, I think, back to very difficult political questions that we would uh, largely prefer to avoid. So you don't think, do you, that we can get out of the counterterrorism business? You don't think that we that there can be – it's one thing to say we can't just have a military response. It's another thing to believe that. Well, we don't need a military response. Really. Well, no, I think I think you have to have. I think you ha- absolutely have to have military responses. I would just say, if I were to use, say, the case of Syria, I think counterterrorism may now actually be counterproductive to U.S. national interests. So, I think you need to look at larger issues. And uh, counterterrorism is a tactic. Some people need <clears throat> to be removed, uh, but it is not. I would argue uh, uh, a a larger policy, and it can it can lead you down into a wormhole. This report's talking about fragile states. Let's define that term a bit in particular. How is a fragile state different from a failing state? I would say they're all on a spectrum of of weakness. So a uh, fragile state is salvageable, and a failing state is probably beyond that. Or a failing state has a longer road back to being a not unfragile, but so, I mean, talk about Nigeria now. Nigeria, you would say, is a, a fragile state or a failing state? It's a fragile it's state. A fragile I state. would use the word fragile to encompass the totality, mm-hmm. and there are degrees of fragility from more or less. Um, and I think is a is a useful way of thinking about it. And what is it? It is um, primarily, in the simplest terms, when you have a, a broken contract between a government and its people. And that usually is some combination of a government that is unable to provide basic services, including citizen security, uh, and or a repressive, corrupt, authoritarian government. In either case, and sometimes they're combined, in either case, citizens no longer trust their government. They don't feel that the government is providing them opportunities and, and basic services. You mentioned Nigeria, so let's just stay in that for one second. Because Nigeria, I, I spent a lot of time there, although years ago, I don't think it's changed significantly, certainly not for the, the better. The idea of making Nigeria a be- much better place strikes me as incredibly challenging. Um, I, I'm not sure how you do it. One of the, you talk about uh, comprehensive preventive strategy and the first part of that is alleviating real and perceived injustice. Uh, 
how do you relieve, alleviate real and, per and perceived injustice in Nigeria or in Libya or, I mean, I'm not sure we've relieved, we know how to relieve uh, real and perceived injustice here in the United States. I would think a lot of people would say we, we are not doing so. Well, first of all, I think the biggest lesson that's emerged is that it requires local ownership and local leadership, that this is fundamentally uh, going to be done by local communities, local and national governments. It, it can't be something that's imposed by the United States. But we can do a better job of aligning our various capabilities, including our diplomatic, our security, and our development efforts, um, and look at how you provide incentives and how you find partnerships that can move these kinds of approaches forward. We have, we have not been doing that with, with intentionality and coordination across our government, as well as coordination with the international community. And a lot of these grievances start from governments that are uh, not inclusive that are limited to one particular ethnic group or religious group, and that causes the grievance. So one of the things when we say it's a governance problem, one of the key elements of that is governance that are more inclusive so that people have an opportunity to participate in governance and services that are provided throughout the society rather than just to some groups and not others. Of course, if you talk about Nigeria, um, which has various ethnic and religious groups, um, for the most part, throughout most of its history, Muslims have been the political leadership of the country. The Christians and have been more in the commercial sector. Nonetheless, that didn't stop the growth in the north, which is largely Muslim, of Boko Haram, which is essentially a franchise of Al Qaeda. Now, I think I understand you in the sense that, you're, that we don't think that Boko Haram does what it does because they perceive injustice and they are trying to fight it. They want power. Uh, they want to carry weapons. They want to kill infidels. They want to take slave girls. They're doing all of that. And even if you had a very good health care system and a much better uh, welfare system, they wouldn't care. They want power. Now, they may have some more difficulty recruiting, possibly, but you can't say that Muslims were excluded from the political partnership in Nigeria. That's not what caused Boko Haram. Except for the leadership of Boko Haram were, they came from a tribe in northeastern Nigeria uh, that was historically marginalized. And their part of that of the country um, historically did not receive investment in basic schools, roads, uh, you know, opportunities. So they did have a sense of perceived injustice. Um, and it was coupled with exposure to Al Qaeda. Uh, and then because you have a large population that has this perceived injustice and lack of opportunity, you had a fertile recruiting ground. And those are some of the elements that we see coming together that have prompted um, this growth of extremism in fragile states over the last 17 years. A huge problem for the U.S. government has always been is that the rulers in the region would come to us and they would say, you know, I play moi le déluge. And uh, that is uh, yep. has been a pretty compelling argument. I, I must say, I, I think uh, it right now is is compelling once again. Uh, it, not to me, but I think many in Washington would accept it. Uh, so this, but this how's that worked? Well, I mean, I don't think I don't think it's worked well at all. And I would uh, I would argue that the most productive period in the Middle East was actually uh, the period under George W. Bush's presidency. Because you saw a huge discussion develop about democracy in the region. Sometimes it would be very anti-American. They'd say, who are the Americans to deliver democracy? But at the same time, the end result of that was uh, an unparalleled uh, explosion, which in part, I think, led uh, to the Great Arab Revolt. I prefer to use that phrase in the, the Arab Spring. Uh, I would argue that is what you want to see, that type of thing. It's very convulsive. It's very tumultuous. It's very unsettling for us. It opens up opportunities for a lot of bad guys. But at the same time, I think you have to pay attention to what your enemy tells you. And if your enemy tells you that what they fear actually are Muslims voting, then let them vote. This is uh, it brings us to an interesting question because you're, the report here does not talk about nation building. It talks about bolstering resilience in fragile states. Um, 
am I wrong to think you said, no, we can't talk about nation building. That's a bridge too far. We'll alienate a lot of people who've, who have given up on nation building, one of whom is not Ruel Mark Gerecht, who is still very much in favor of nation building. He is not alone in Washington, but he is a somewhat lonely character. Uh, he, obviously, you thought about this and said, what is the difference between nation building and bolstering resistance? I think I know, but tell me. Well, I think the biggest distinction is who's doing it. And what we've learned is it's probably not going to be the most effective if it's the U.S. coming in to build a nation, that it absolutely requires local ownership and local leadership to make these kinds of changes. And so it's not necessarily do we need a gigantic new package of aid, but how do we more effectively use the resources and capabilities that we already have? So you're sort of saying we're not going to export democracy, but we're going to support Democrats small d where we can find them. I think the issue is legitimate and effective governance that can provide security and economic opportunity and services to the people. And I think a lot of, in a lot of these places, that's going to start actually from the bottom up. And you're going to build that kind of acceptance from localities up. What we can do is what we started in the Bush administration, it's been uh, embraced by the Obama administration and the Trump administration, is something like the Millennium Challenge account, which is incentivizes countries to make decisions in favor of inclusive governance, investing in their people, uh, and um, and building legitimacy uh, over time. Uh, it's you know I think the toughest problem when you say the fundamental problem is governance, governance that is not inclusive, that is not uncorrupt, and that actually. Uh, includes all of its citizens. It's very tough to get authoritarians who legitimately point to a terrorism problem and say, you know, I get governance, I'll get that to that tomorrow, but today I have the problem of terrorism. And we simply have to incentivize those governments and get them to understand that if they are really going to deal with their internal problem of ex extremism, it's going to have to start with better governance, even as they deal with the issue of counterterrorism. It is difficult. Uh, it is probably the hardest piece of this. Uh, but there are mechanisms and there are some examples where com countries have been willing to move in this direction. Give me a couple of examples. You're seeing, I think, some attention to this in terms of countries like Tunisia, and we can talk about that. It has other problems in terms of countries like Jordan. Um, you're beginning to see in the crown prince of Saudi Arabia and Vision 2030, uh, it has elements of the kinds of things that we've wanted to see a Saudi administration do for 60 years. Uh, the United Arab Emirates is beginning to do that. Uh, we at USIP have been working trying to build resilient communities and better governance again from the bottom up. So I'm going to press you a little bit on this. Building resilience is different from nation building, only in the sense that we're trying to assist the nation builders rather than do it for them? The nation building, unfortunately, got the connotation, as Nancy said, that this is something we're going to do in countries. And the truth is the United States can't build another country. We can build our own, but people have to build their own countries. And so and we build their own states and their own institutions. Exactly. I mean, that's what nation building doesn't really mean nation building, does it? It means building the institutions of it's governance. Exactly right. Yeah. And in this case, institutions of government that will help the society be resilient against extremism and terrorists. And that's what we we're talking about in this report. And Cliff, can I go back to another one of your questions? You said, are we really, you mentioned democracy. And I want to bring democracy back in because it is fundamentally the, what we're putting on the table. But unfortunately, it often gets thought about in terms of the mechanics. Was there an election or not? You know, some of those functions as opposed to the core, what Steve described of a relationship between a government and the citizens you know, that is healthy and delivering. And so it's a it's a democracy that's truly delivering for its people, which is not the case in every country, um, as we know. I guess part of what makes me pessimistic and, and a place where I disagree with Ruel is, take a country like Turkey. They've been voting for years and years and years. Um, they have been putting in place various institutions of government. They're reasonably prosperous. We do not see them 
becoming a freer country at this point. We see authoritarianism rising. Um, the president, probably for life, Erdogan, has openly said democracy is like a streetcar. When you get to your stop, you get off. Uh, legitimacy is an interesting word to use. We know what we mean by it, but if I'm an Islamist, not Islamic, Islamist of almost any stripe, I say it's the, then legitimacy means we abide by the word of God, not that we abide by the word of man or the laws of man. We must follow Sharia law as inter- as I think it should be interpreted. And obviously, there can, not obviously, there can be many interpretations of Sharia law. There are from Jordan to Morocco to Turkey to uh, Saudi Arabia to uh, to Iran. These are all different interpretations of Sharia. So you can't say Sharia is one thing, although people do on the left and the right. They seem to think that think that it is. But this is a really hard thing. We are saying here's we think we know what legitimacy means, but the people we are competing with, they have a very different view of it, and they will try to convince people what you want is not that everybody votes, including the infidels. What you want is for the right the the, the right um, uh, interpreters of Sharia and the right and, and, and the jurisprudence if we were Iran. We have to be the ones governing. And that's what it means that Iran is a theocracy, is people who theoretically say that I understand religion better than everybody else. Therefore, I need to rule. I mean, I I just say that, I mean, Western history is hardly what I would call a straight line to liberal democracy. It is, was truly messy, if not grotesque. And as uh, my good, uh, my former teacher and good friend Olivier Hua once put it that, uh, you know, if you had to wait for uh, the French to have a democratic culture, they would still have a monarchy. Uh, you know, this the, it's a process. Now, part of that process has to be voting. I would argue, actually, the mechanics of this are incredibly important to creating the culture. They, they are, but they can't be the only, the only no, measure. No, and no, 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 but I, I just, I, I, I think the, I mean, Middle Eastern dictators have a way of knowing what they, what they believe is good for their survival. And uh, loosening the uh, politics of their country and reform is usually not what they put at the top of the totem pole. Uh, I And I think we're going – we're sort of in a cul-de-sac here. Uh, I don't know, you know, where this goes. I mean that's why what would happen in Egypt was so important and, and so depressing. I would say in, in Turkey, I mean I, all I would say is the game is hardly over. And it's important to realize that Kemalism, many aspects of Kemalism that we like, of course, were created through dictatorship. Uh, and that what you're, it's relatively few years in Turkey that we've seen a process which could be plausibly described as democratic. Uh, it's a messy process. You've got a lot of people there who felt like they were excluded from the system, who were vastly more religious, who people in Istanbul and Ankara and Izmir didn't even, uh, bother to look at, they avoided, uh, you know, they're getting a little payback time now. I agree that it's a messy process. I'm not sure I share your faith that it's an inevitable process, that there's something Darwinian about it, that this is the way we evolve. Oh, no, 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 no I, 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 I don't. I just that I, I do think that unless you go down, if you don't open the door, you're never going to get anywhere. If you don't open the door, you're just going to be stuck with dictatorship. and You're going to have all the problems of dictatorship, which in the Middle East and the Muslim Middle East have metastasized and have produced uh, the type of extremism, the type of violence, which, of course, uh, bloodied us badly on 9-11. There are uh, ex- these extremist elements in about 19 countries in the Middle East. They have actually tried to establish governance in about 10 of them. And they have largely been rejected by the populations. Look at how many times in Iraq, sections of the country have been governed by Islamist rule, if you will, under Sharia, this very harsh, non-democratic rule. And it has not taken. And uh, the Sunnis threw them off in the awakening uh, in 2007, 2008. And the Iraqi people have thrown out the Islamic State now again. Uh, here in the last two years. So that is the play. Uh, but we believe that in the end of the day, people want to make decisions for their own future. And in historically, when people have generally been given that op- opportunity, they have voted with the ballot box or with their feet in favor of more open and responsive societies. Uh, that does not mean that it's inevitable, does not mean that it is overnight. It is a struggle. 
Um, and uh, it, it is a, a sort of a continual struggle as we see. People in the end of the day have to fight and win their own freedom. And let me say one thing about elections. Elections are not the be-all and end-all. But I think what Raul, Raul was saying was elections have a way many times of bringing to power people who want to build democratic institutions, which ultimately will be the long-term safeguard for democracy going forward. So it is fair to say elections are not the be-all and end-all, but do not discount them about a process as part of a process by which people build democratic institutions and freer societies. But you certainly need the institutions, the democratic institutions and the habits before elections can succeed. Otherwise, you end up, for example, we had the voting in the Gaza and the West Bank. I was on a committee reporting to Condi Rice. And I must say, I was skeptical that this was going to work. I said, if you can't get up on a soapbox and speak freely and know you, that you won't, you can step off the, spoke, the soapbox rather than be shot and fall off. I don't think there can be a free or fair Well, the, the elections were not free and fair. And of course, we haven't had other, we haven't had elections since, uh, since then, uh, since 2005, 2006. I think Turkey is a good example. Turkey had a thin democracy. It did not have the deep democratic institutions it needed. And it has not been able to stand up to Erdogan's authoritarian impulses. But the, the struggle in Turkey is not over. Well, I, not to dwell too long in elections, yeah. but I, I think one of the problems is when, when in a country that's undergone a significant upheaval is the right time to bring an election in. And what we see too frequently is a rush to elections in a way that can often crystallize differences within a population as opposed to move it towards democracy. So in my mind, it's just keeping all these pieces related so that you can actually move things forward instead of checking boxes. It's exactly not just right. the mechanisms. Exactly right. There are two examples where it seems to me we have been trying really hard to build resilience in the world. One is Afghanistan for the past 17 years, and that is that story is not over, but it's hardly a success story as we speak. The other is Lebanon, where we're still pouring in resources, even though it's pretty plain to some that Lebanon is now entirely dominated by Hezbollah, which is a terrorist proxy of the Islamic Republic of Iran. If those are examples of building resilience, and maybe they're not, or maybe they're not using the right tools, those are not success stories. So let me speak to both of those very quickly. Let me take Lebanon. Lebanon is a story about how difficult it is to build an inclusive democratic future if you live in a bad neighborhood. And if you look at the burdens Lebanon had from Israeli occupation in the 1980s, a Syrian occupation until recently under the Bush administration. You look at the role Hezbollah is playing backed by Iran. Uh, if you look at the refugees that uh, the Lebanese society is uh, carrying, you know, it, it's a pretty heavy rucksack the Lebanese have on the journey to a democratic future. Afghanistan, uh, one of the things I think we did not appreciate was uh, it is was at the time in 2001 one of the world's poorest countries had natural resources very little by the way of human uh, resources and if you think about those post conflict countries that have uh, made the transition to stable democracies they either had a big head start as terms of Europe at the end of the World War II. Or they took a long time in terms of South Korea, for example, after the Korean War. And one of the things we make the point in, in this report is it's hard going. We didn't know how to do it in 2001. We've learned a lot. We have some lessons in the recommendations that the, that the task force is now going to put together and put out after the first of the year. We will try to make a series of concrete recommendations based on the evidence over the last 17 years of what we've learned that has worked. But in any event, it's going to take a long time and it's going to take patience. And the argument we are making is that it, and it's an argument, quite frankly, you have made very eloquently in some of the pieces you've written. It takes a long time. We got to have patience. And what we have to do is to make the case to the American people that it's important. Make the case to countries in the region that they have to be partners and they have to take the principal responsibility and then get Europeans, 
regional allies, international institutions to bear some of the cost uh, and increasing portion of the cost and then deal with outsiders like Iran and Russia and China who are making this progression harder rather than easier. That's that's a tough prescription, but that's what we need if we're going to do this. And it's not going to be easy and it's going to take a long time. But if the United States does not lead the effort, not pay for the effort, does not lead the effort, it will not happen. Final question. I, I'd like to go on for a very long time. You probably could too. And that is in terms of patients, we're 17 years from the attacks of 9-11, almost 40 years from the Islamic revolution in Iran, 17 years from now. 40 years from now, where will we be? I am going to argue that we should recognize the fact that 17 years from now and probably 40 years from now, there will still be a military component to this. That this is, World War II was a high intensity conflict. It lasted not a lot of years, but it had millions of deaths. The conflict we're in now is low intensity, but I don't believe that it is going to end in 17 or 20 years. And I think we need to tell people the truth about that because our enemies understand this conflict is going to go on. They have reasons to continue to fight it. And unless we get used to that, we have very few choices. I mean, you know what Orwell said? If you want to, if you, if you want to end a war quickly, surrender. So uh, the 9-11 Commission made three recommendations. We need to fight the terrorists. We need to harden the homeland at home. And we need to have a preventive strategy to try to counter the spread of extremism. It's that piece that has been missing. And without attention to that piece, you guarantee that we will have a military operation going in the indefinite future. A Sunni tribal leader said to Nancy and I when we met with him in February, you know, you've won the war in Iraq three times against Saddam, against al-Qaeda, and against the Islamic State. How come you're not doing more to win the peace? One of the one of the critical challenges as we look at the next 17 years is doing a better job of having a shared understanding across our military, diplomatic, and development capabilities. And without that, we sometimes undercut our efforts. But I strongly believe that if we, if we come to a shared understanding of how to address these underlying causes of, of extremism in fragile states, um, that will have greater traction in meeting that objective over the next however many years, and it will be a long time. Well, I know you're accustomed to having last, last words, so I'll let you have that. I'm a, I'm a medievalist by training and disposition, so I'm by, <laughs> I'm by definition very patient. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this has been a, a, a useful discussion, um, one that needs to continue. And I, of course, look forward to the final report, which is coming out next year. So for now, let me just say thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Ruel. And thanks to all of you out there in podcast land. I hope we've given your brain a good workout this afternoon or this evening, whenever you're listening. Thanks again for being with us on Foreign Policy. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Foreign Policy. As always, find and subscribe to our show on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. If you like this week's episode and have feedback for us, please leave us a review on iTunes. We'd appreciate your thoughts and your criticisms, too. We hope you'll join us again in the future, but until then, I'm Cliff May, and you've been listening to Foreign Policy. Foreign Policy.